All right, so as promised. So yes, so thank you all for joining Tin Mountain for, as I said, our final um, evening program of the season. Um, we, are, um, we are excited for tonight's program, um, but before I go ahead and hand things over to, um, to our presenter, I do just want to um, take a moment to first thank Tin Mountain's Nature Program Series sponsors, and those are Hancock Lumber, Ragged Mountain Equipment, and White Mountain Oil and Propane. So we thank them for their financial support that allows us to, um, to put on great programs like this. I also want to thank all of you who are watching, who are current members of Tin Mountain Conservation Center. Your membership dollars go towards helping us fulfill our mission, including um, our nature program series. So thank you so much to our members. If you're not a member of Tin Mountain, I would encourage you to consider doing so. Um, in the upper right-hand corner on our website, tinmountain.org, um, there is a support us tab and membership information there. Um, there is also information there if membership isn't right for you right now. Um, there is the opportunity just to donate directly to our nature program series to help us keep these going. So um, I would encourage you to, uh, to consider supporting Tin Mountain if you don't already. In addition to tonight's program, um, and as I mentioned, it's our final, um, our final virtual presentation of the series um, of the season although we are, are already busy in scheduling our fall programs and lots of exciting um, evening programs uh, mm -hmm. to look forward to there. But um, a couple of in-person programs that we have coming up, um, as I mentioned, um, our final birding in the Brownfield Bog of the season takes place this Saturday. Um, if you want to join us for that, please um, check out tinmountain.org for registration information. Um, coming up, we also have, um, as part of our North Country Nature Program series, we have a spring wildflower walk that is happening Saturday, June 4th um, at one o'clock up at Great Glen Trails in Pinkham Notch. Um, that same day, Saturday, June 4th, in the morning, um, we have a children's craft program scheduled down at our nature center. Um, and then uh, in the middle of the month on Thursday, June 16th, we have um, back by popular demand, our ladies on the lake, um, all female paddle. Um, this year we will be, um, we'll be going out that evening on Iona Lake. So information on all of those programs on our website. Um, and I would encourage you if you're interested in any of, in any of those to visit our website um, to learn more about that. Before I hand things over to tonight's presenter, um, just one, um, so, uh, one piece of housekeeping. Um, if you have a question um, or comment during the presentation, the best way for you to pass that along is to type it directly into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. I will be monitoring that chat um, during the presentation. If it's an immediate clarifying question, I will um, I will pop in and um, can ask that of Harry. Otherwise, I will plan to save those questions until the end, um, at which point I will read through those questions. Um, and if at that point anyone has any additional questions, you can either type them into the chat or you can um, unmute yourself and ask them directly of Harry. Um, and to that effect, everyone um, you probably noticed you were muted on entry. Um, that's just to make sure we don't pick up any unintentional background um, background noise that could distract viewers. Um, and so I would ask that you um, that you keep yourself muted unless um, unless you have something to share at the very end. And that's all. That's all the talking. <laughs> Um, that I will do at you. I will, um, you know, I'm excited to hand things over to Harry Vogel. He is the director and senior biologist at the Loon Preservation Committee 
in um, in Moultonboro. Um, we are very excited um, to have Harry back, even even if it has to be virtual. We were trying very hard to make this work as um, as in person, but we appreciate his willingness to uh, to present virtually as well. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Tin Mountain um, and LPC have um, you know have been partnering and working um, for the the past several years um, with Tin Mountain, helping to monitor. Um, loon nests up in the Mount Washington Valley. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Harry. Great. Thank you, Nora. Um, and I have to say uh, to, to everybody listening to this presentation, I was so happy to, uh, to get an email from Nora asking us to asking me to come and, and talk about loons this evening. Um, I'm such a fan of Tin Mountain. I think they, they do great work. Um, and I'm just so impressed with, with the organization. Uh, my only um, my only disappointment was was that I, I I said Nora I would love to just come down and and do this talk in person because uh, I always love coming to the center you know and and it's just such a great such a beautiful building such a great vibe to come in there and and see um, all the interesting stuff that's around the center as as well um, you know but but here we are in the age of COVID and, and Zoom and and uh, we do what we can and we and we make do so. Um, so happy to be doing this by Zoom. I will be even happier if you want me back in a, in a year or two to uh, to come and, and do it in person too. Um, and you know, and as Nora said, um, one of the the reasons you know that I'm so happy to do this is because there really is that great collaboration between Loon Preservation Committee and Tin Mountain. And um, Tin Mountain has made real and substantive contributions to our work to monitor loons in in New Hampshire. Um, and uh, I know that Rick Steber was, you know, involved uh, with with that, and Dana Duxbury Fox, number of other, you know, volunteers and and staff uh, that are that are helping, and it's been a great collaboration. It has really helped us in our in our mission to be able to um, to monitor these loons and and uh, do some management and some research as well. And and I'll talk more about all of that um, as well as as the the, uh, the talk goes on. So. Um, but for, for this evening, what I'd love to uh, be able to do for you folks is talk a little bit about loons and some of the challenges that are facing loons. And that um, moves very naturally into the Loon Preservation Committee and the reasons why this organization was created and the work that we were doing to preserve loons here in New Hampshire. So, oh. and of course, why is my slide not advancing? Nora, this worked perfectly during our. Oh, okay. Let's see. There we go. We got it. Okay. Yes, we are um, good. So, <laughs> just a little bit there. Um, so, um, I am a biologist by training, and and um, in the in the realm of biology, as in any human endeavor, the work that we do as biologists over our careers is always based on the work of others who have come before. And in the world of loons, certainly one of those pioneering uh, people was Judy McIntyre. Judy did her PhD way back in 1975 on loons and people and the interactions between those two species. A lot of great research has been done on loons since then, but a lot, much of that harkens back to that initial work that Judy did. And in addition to being a great researcher, Judy was also a little bit of a philosopher and she referred to loons and their calls as a, as a symbol of wilderness and the positive affirmation of wild things and wild places and wild sounds in the night. And loons have really come to typify the nature experience for a lot of outdoors people. And there are good reasons for that. These are impressive birds. You know, one of the first things that we hear from people when they come into the loon center and they see one of our taxidermy loons, our mounted loons here, they say, oh, I had no idea that they were so big. And, and one of the reasons, I, I think, a um, couple of reasons for that, one is that loons are a very dense bodied bird. And so like an iceberg, as they're floating out there in the, in the lake, they're most, much of them or most of them is below the surface that you can't see, um, where you can't see them. And the other thing is often as they're floating out there in the lake, there's nothing to give us a sense of scale for those birds. But a big male uh, loon in, in, New, in New England, you know, New Hampshire and, and Maine can be 15, sometimes 16 pounds uh, in size, so close to goose size. 
They've got this striking black and white plumage. They've got these blood red eyes. They have these distinctive and far ranging calls. And in fact, my very favorite loon quote comes from a British researcher who way back in the 1950s described the nighttime calling of loons as a chorus from all of the devils in hell. And so whether you love it or it sends chills up and down your spine, you're not likely to forget those calls or the birds that made them. And then if you add a downy chick like this one that you can see riding up in the back with one of its parents, and you hooked a fair proportion of your population. So even non-bird watchers, people who don't know the difference between a house finch and a house sparrow, they know and care about their loons. And that makes loons a powerful force for conservation. So the pictures I've shown you up until now have all been the common loon. As the name implies, that is the most common of our loon species. It's the most widespread of our loons. It's the only loon that actually breeds um, in New Hampshire, but there are actually five different species of loons. And so this is the yellow-billed loon. And the chief difference is that it's, it's namesake, that yellow or ivory um, colored bill. Um, and uh, the chief difference, um, another chief difference is that these are breeders of the far north. So you're gonna find these birds in the Arctic tundra. This is a Pacific loon, uh, much smaller than the yellow-billed loon or our common loons, only about half the size, more widespread than the yellow-billed loon, um, but again, a breeder in the tundra and the taiga regions of Alaska and the very northern Canada. This is the Arctic loon, and if you're thinking it looks very similar to that Pacific loon I just showed you, um, that's because it is, in fact, and actually they are so similar that up until 1985, we considered these two species one and the same bird. And it was only based on looking at the actual genes of these birds and very slight morphological differences in the coloration and the body shape that they were split apart into two separate species. So Arctic loons are mostly a Eurasian species, but we do have some um, that are up in the extreme Northern tip of Alaska. And then this is the red-throated loon. So this is the smallest, of our loons, it's, a, it's the least loon-like of our loons, probably branched off fairly early from that loon family tree. Um, it's the only loon that can take off directly from land without a long running start across the surface of the, of the water, if you've ever seen our common loons take off. Um, this red-throated loons also is far northern species, but this is the only other loon besides the common loon that you're likely to see in New Hampshire, because even though they breed again in the far north, they will overwinter off of the Atlantic coast here in, in New Hampshire. So if you go down to Odeorn Point, Rye, the, the Seacoast Science Center there, you can look out and um, in and amongst all the common loons that are, are wintering, you will occasionally see a red-throated loon uh, there as well. And every year we have reports of them on some of our larger lakes as they migrate back and forth between the breeding grounds and the wintering grounds. So this is not a loon, this is a duck. To male common merganser, uh, to be exact. So every year we get reports of a loon with 12 little babies, you know, behind it. And we try and tell people, you know, that's not going to be a loon because loons have only one or two uh, chicks at a time. And sometimes people get really irate, right? And they, and they will say, now look, I've lived in the Lakes region in New Hampshire all my life. I know a loon when I, when I see one. And that was a loon with 12 little babies, you know, behind it. And so we thank them for those reports and then we quietly just kind of vertical file those and we don't refer them back to them again. And I can see why there could be a mistake in, identif in identification of these birds because like a loon, you know, these mergansers are, at least the males, are black and white diving, fish-eating birds. But there are several obvious differences as, as well when you look a little bit more closely. So one is that a common merganser is only about half the size, you know, again, of, of a loon. They sit far higher out of the water, so they're a more buoyant um, bird. They show a lot more white along their sides. They don't have that black and white checkerboarding pattern along the back. They're missing the, um, uh, the, the necklace marking along the back of their neck. And then when you, if you can get um, observe really carefully, loons also have a little chin strap marking um, right below their, their head. Uh, and then there's that bill, which is bright red instead of uh, a dark, you know, black uh, or, or dark gray bill of our loons. So and there are other, you know, differences as well. The musculature and the skeleton, the body structure, 
um, all of which render loons very distinct from ducks. And in fact, one of the fastest ways to really annoy a loon researcher is to call them ducks or waterfowl because they're not either one of those things. Oh, if loons are not ducks, what are the most closely related living species? Where do loons fit in with other birds? And would you believe penguins are one of those closely related species? And, and some this is a, an emperor penguin. Some people are surprised when I uh, show this slide. Others will say, well, you know, they've got that black and white kind of formal coloration um, as, as well. Uh, obviously, several distinct differences, though, uh, you know, once again, chief among those are that penguins are flightless. So those wings of that penguin have been so highly modified uh, to move them through the water that they're no good at all for moving them through the air any, anymore. Um, and even that, you know, that's very different than loons who are using their big webbed feet and not their wings to move around underwater. The topper for me, though, is that penguins are entirely um, a group of birds of the southern hemisphere, whereas the loon family is entirely a northern hemisphere bird. So we probably have to go way back uh, in evolution to find a common ancestor for those birds. And the story gets even stranger because the other closely related species are the tube-nosed swimmers. And those are the albatrosses, the petrels, and the shearwaters. And so it seems strange um, that we have uh, made this kind of unlikely grouping but the genes don't lie. And, and way back now in 1983, a couple of geneticists, Sibley and Alquist, did this genetic assay of all the living groups of birds. And what they found was that these three groups, the loons, the penguins, the tube nosed swimmers, grouped out fairly close to each other and, and fairly distinct from all of those other living groups of, of birds. Um, and there's one other thing that makes us feel better about this unlikely grouping. And that is a lifestyle characteristic that all of them have in common and that is the ocean. And so people, um, those of us who love loons, while we tend to think of loons as freshwater birds that yes, go to the ocean you know, to overwinter, it's just as correct, maybe more correct to think of loons as ocean birds that come to freshwater only to breed. So I'll talk a little bit more about the lifestyle of, of loons. So um, loons, again, diving, fish eating birds. Any of us who spent any time on a lake are, are very familiar with another fish eating bird, the great blue heron. And herons and loons though, go about that business of catching fish in a very different way. So a blue heron is an ambush predator. It's a classic ambush predator. It, it does its best to imitate a tree and wait for a fish or a crayfish or a frog to swim by and then it will snap it up. So loons in contrast are very active predators. So a loon will actually peer beneath the surface of the water. It's looking for a fish or a school of fish swimming around down there. When it sees them, it will dive down and it will give chase. And um, so, and a lot of times people will ask me, well, what's the favorite food of a loon? Turns out loons have very few taste buds on their tongues. So there's not very much evidence that they are choosing fish based on any kind of taste preference. I will tell people, that it's usually the fish themselves that determine whether or not they're gonna be caught by a loon. Because if a loon is, dies down and uh, is chasing any of our, um, our the, the cold water um, species, the ones that we think of as good eating, right? The trout or the landlocked salmon, any of the, the torpedo, the fusiform torpedo shaped fish, their method of escaping from a loon or another predator is put on a burst of speed and head straight down into that dark, you know, deep air part of the lake, and they can actually outrun a loon. So loons are typically not all that successful in catching those types of fish, but our warm water species, and by those I mean um, a yellow perch or a smallmouth bass um, or largemouth bass or, or a sunfish, uh, many of our minnow species, if they're being chased by a loon or any other predator, their method of escaping is to try and zigzag like crazy at the surface of the water. And loons are so maneuverable that every time they zig or zag, a loon can cut the corner on them until it gets close enough to reach out with its, with its head and, and grab that fish in its bill. Usually those fish are swallowed underwater. There's a couple of exceptions to that. Um, catfish, right, are really spiny. So if a loon swallow, gets a catfish or even an, another large fish, um, it, will, it will want to make sure it goes down the right way. And so they will often bring those to the surface and manipulate them to make sure they're going down head first. And this loon that you see on the screen is probably on its way to feed that fish to one of its chicks. 
So a couple of adaptations that make loons very good at what they do, um, diving underwater and, and catching fish. And one of those is pretty obvious on this picture, and that is that the legs of loons are placed at the far back of the body. So this is all wrong for walking, but it makes them incredibly efficient swimmers and divers. So they can move through the water. It's like a torpedo, you know, to, to watch them. The other uh, adaptation that you can't see that's not obvious from the picture is that the bones of loons are very dense, much more dense than other flighted birds. And in fact, some I've heard from some people, I've even read in some books, oh, well, loons have solid bones. Actually not true, they're not solid, but they're very thick walled and, and very dense, um, you know, much more dense again than the bones of other flying birds. And when you think about it, that makes sense. Because if any of us have ever tried to dive beneath the surface of the water, spend any amount of time down there, uh, wearing water wings, right, or any kind of flotation that works by trapping bubbles of air, you know that that's not a great strategy if you want to spend any amount of time, you know, in the in the depths on that water. So those solid or, or those thick, thick, dense bones um, minimize the air pockets in those bones and allow loons to have kind of a neutral buoyancy and stay underwater for a long period of time with a minimum of effort. Another view of a swimming loon, um, and I, I show this just to show uh, folks that the wings of, of this bird are held tight against the body. And so they're not really used for getting around underwater and they're not flying like a penguin does. It's all, it's all those big webbed feet. So the wings of loons when they're underwater and chasing a fish are actually a little bit of a detriment to these loons because all they do is create a little bit of extra drag on that body. And that's the reason why the wings of loons are actually very small for their body size. So there's a combination of, of our concept called wing loading. And essentially all that means is that the com is that every square inch you know, of a loon's wing holds aloft more body weight than virtually any other flying bird. Um, we call that wing loading. And, and essentially that combination of small wings and a heavy body um, means that it can be hard for loons to take off, get into the air, and then also to stay in the air. So they're second only to the swans in terms of that wing loading here in North America. And for that reason, you'll often see that it's a long running start across the surface of the water to get enough air going over those tiny wings to lift that heavy, dense body off of the water. On a dead calm day, um, that runway can be up to a quarter of a mile uh, before a loon gets airborne. So here's a loon it's, that's almost you know, achieved um, flight here at, at, at this point so in the process again of taking off, um, especially on a small lake. Sometimes people will notice that the loons will take off and they'll make one or two circuits around the lake before they end up flying off in one direction or another. And that's not a scenic tour on the part of that loon. Every circuit helps that bird gain a few precious feet of altitude until it can clear the trees at the water's edge. Once in the air though, their flight is swift and it's direct. And so loons will beat their wings up to four times a second in flight. And that allows them to reach a speed of up to 80 miles per hour in level flight. And in fact, there's a couple of pieces of hunter folklore in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, one was that if a loon was happily floating on the surface of the lake and you would fire at the loon, the loon would see the flash from the muzzle of your rifle and be able to dive under the waves before the bullet reached it. The other is that if you were to shoot at a flying loon, the shot from your shotgun would, would not be able to overtake the loon. And I think a lot of loons lost their lives testing those theories. And we and thankfully, you know, we don't do that anymore with our loons. So the legs way at the far back of that body means that loons are almost helpless on land. So they really can't walk at all. They can really just kind of push themselves along on their fronts, or they can balance for brief periods of time, as you see this one on the nest, as they're um, creating a nest material or rolling eggs or something of that nature. But that um, really limited mobility on land is why a loon is always nesting right next to the water. And those nests can you know, vary quite a lot. They can be elaborate structures like this one that's made up of pile, mud, and vegetation. Or they can be just a shallow scrape in the sand and they can be right out in the open like this one is. Or they can be pretty well hidden. So most of us don't think of that black and white 
speckling along a loon's back as camouflage. But if a loon is nesting under vegetation that only allows dappled sunlight to reach the, the ground, it can actually work pretty well to break up the outline of that bird on the nest. Two eggs are typically laid in the nest. As you can see, they're camouflaged pretty well against their nest material. And that's important because at the beginning of incubation, loons can leave those nests untended, sometimes for an hour or even more at a time. As the loon continues to incubate that egg, they've invested more time and energy into those eggs and also the, the embryo it's developing in those eggs uh, becomes more and more sensitive to changes in temperature. So it needs that constant body temperature to continue to, to uh, develop. Uh, and so towards the end of incubation, loons are spending about 99% of their time on those eggs on the nest. A little bit bigger than a chicken egg, probably make a heck of an omelet, but of course we don't do that at the Loon Preservation Committee either. So both parents share in all aspects of chick rearing, and that includes making the nest, to incubating the eggs, to feeding and caring for the chicks. Um, the uh, nest exchanges can tend to happen maybe every four to six hours, but that can vary widely from pair to pair. And um, as those nests are exchanged, and usually several times in between the nest exchanges, the adults will take those opportunities to, to balance up on those hind legs and roll their eggs. And rolling their eggs, we think, um, helps in a couple of different ways. It flushes bad gases out, carbon dioxide, lets in fresh oxygen, and it also keeps the embryo from sticking to uh, one side of the egg. And then after about 28 days, if all goes well, um, we have this, our first chick. Uh, if two eggs are laid, those eggs are typically laid between one and three days apart, and they will most often um, hatch within 24 or maybe 30 hours of each other. The chicks will stay on the nest until they're dry, sometimes overnight, and then typically they'll take right to the water. So here are a couple of newborn chicks in their first coat of dark brown. They're almost black when they uh, first hatch. And as you can see, this chick is not gonna be flying anytime soon. Those wing buds are not very well developed, but those legs and feet are ready for action and these chicks can swim as soon as they're hatched. And despite that, we'll often see this, a couple of chicks riding up on the back of a parent. We think there are a couple of reasons why loons uh, will do this. And one is that cold water can suck heat out of a tiny body very quickly. So it probably helps these chicks to thermoregulate, to maintain a, a good and, and constant um, body temperature. The other is that an awful lot of things will eat loon chicks if they can get them. And so uh, it's probably overall, it's just the safest place for a chick to be is riding up on the back of one of its parents. Chicks grow very rapidly. After two weeks, they have lost that first coat of really dark, almost black down, and they've molted into this kind of light brown gray down that you see here. And then by seven weeks, they have that, uh, the second coat of down is now molting off and they're just beginning, if you look carefully at, at that loon on the left to show some juvenile feathers um, on the back. And these are the feathers that give shape and contour to the body. They allow for longer dives and eventually they allow for flight as well. And then by 10 weeks, you know, they look recognizably like our majestic loons, at least in profile. Um, this kind of gray um, plumage, this is actually a juvenile plumage, but it looks a lot like the basic or the winter plumage of, of loons. Um, and this is pretty much what this bird is going to look like for the next 24 months. So it's only at about, you know, 26 months of age that loons first molt into that uh, familiar black and white plumage, which we actually call the alternate or the breeding plumage of the loon. In about 10 weeks, the flight feathers have grown in at this point, but the flight, the muscles that are required for flight are still developing. And by this time, these chicks are very able uh, to catch their own food, but it's still easier to beg from your parents for a little while longer if you can. And then by 12 or 13 weeks, you know, they're flying. So at this point, we consider them to be fledged. For the rest of that summer though, they're gonna stick pretty tightly to their natal lake. So this is where their parents are. Uh, they're familiar with that lake. They know where the good fishing spots are at, at this point, uh, but they will begin to make you know, flights uh, to other territories or to even to other uh, lakes as, as well. 
And then by fall, you know, these birds are pretty much fully grown. And by that time, the adults have molted out of their breeding plumage, or they're in the process of molting out of their breeding plumage into that drab gray winter plumage. And it can actually be hard to tell them apart. So the needs of loons are really very simple when you think about it. They are diving, fish-eating birds. And so they need clean water to catch the fish that they need to eat, and they need quiet places to incubate those eggs and to raise their young. And it's when one or more of these things are missing that loons run into trouble. So the large lakes that loons claim as breeding territories are also unfortunately the endpoints for many of our toxins. And one toxin that we have at Balloon Preservation Committee, we've had our eyes on for quite a while now is mercury. It turns out that our loons here in the Northeast have the highest levels of mercury found in the United States. And that's as measured in unhatched loon eggs taken from failed nests, and those are the green bars, and also taken from the blood of live captured loons, and those are the yellow bars. Where does this mercury come from? So, well, mercury is a naturally occurring element, and, and that means that it's present in minute quantities everywhere. And that means it's also present in coal. But the mercury that is present in coal is sequestered underground, bound up in that coal and safely under the surface of the earth where it can't do much harm to living things until we mine that coal and bring it to the surface and then burn it to create electricity. Because mercury is an element, it's hard to destroy. So it survives that combustion process. It goes up the smokestack and then it comes right back down into our lakes and, and ponds. The other thing about mercury is that it's the only metal that is a liquid at room temperatures. And therefore it's got these unique properties that have made it useful uh, in things like old thermometers, in light switches, in batteries, in compact fluorescent uh, light bulbs and things. And when those consumer products have outlived their purposes, um, if we are simply throw them away, you know, rather than recycling them or, 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 or dis disposing of them correctly, uh, they go to a landfill or even worse, to an incinerator, and again, up the milk stack and then right back down again. And so the areas in New Hampshire, and these are the areas in this map that are the orange and the, and the red, um, where loon mercury is highest here in this state are all downwind from coal-fired power plants or municipal waste incinerators. And this is an important issue because mercury is a potent neurotoxin. So as little as 1.3 parts per million of mercury in a loon egg can kill an embryo developing inside of that egg. And we've pulled some eggs off of lakes in New Hampshire with more than four parts per million of mercury in it. So there's no question that it's affecting our loon population. Another problem for loons is shoreline development and the things that go with um, shoreline development. So loons love to nest on islands. We humans also love to nest on islands or otherwise alter the shoreline. And when we do that, we can actually displace these loons from some of their traditional historical nesting sites. Another problem for loons, um, because they have to nest by the water, so they can get into trouble if we move the water. So if we draw down the level of the lake uh, for, power, for power production or for flood control, we can take a loon that was formerly very happily nesting right at the water's edge. If we suddenly drop the level of that lake by two or three feet, we can expose seven or 10 feet of muddy, rocky shoreline. And sometimes it's simply too far for those loons to go to be able to get back to their nest and incubate those eggs. The, uh, the opposite problem is also true if we have a quick water level rise because of the storm event or even the wake uh, from a boat that's going too, too fast or too close to a loon nest can actually swamp those nests and, and wash the eggs right out of the nest in some cases. Close approach of boats can uh, flush an incubating loon from a nest. So if you look closely at that loon on the right-hand side of your screen, that loon is actually relaxed. Its head is up and it's looking around. If these boaters were to come much closer to that bird, it would crane its neck flat across the surface of the nest. We even have a picture of, of this, there's, there's even a name for this. We call it the hangover um, posture. And this is a way for the loon to make itself less conspicuous. And also from this posture, it can quickly explode right off of that nest and have flush from the nest. 
And, uh, and if that happens, you know, and, and sometimes this can happen, right? You can come around a corner, all of a sudden there's a loon on, on a nest and you're surprised, a loon surprise to come that leaves the nest. The good news here is if you leave the area right away, the chances are pretty good that that loon is gonna hop back on the nest, uh, even within 20 or, or 30 minutes. But the danger um, here is that if it's a really hot day, those eggs can cook on the nest. If it's a cool and rainy day, they can chill. Either one of those can kill the embryo developing inside of that loon egg. Um, and an, an, an open loon egg or an open nest, an unattended nest um, is just an invitation to any predator who's working his way along the shoreline or flying overhead to get an easy meal. And a lot of animals are gonna take a loon egg if they can get it. And so uh, prime suspects numbers one and two in, in New Hampshire are probably raccoons and mink, um, but any of our scavenging animals, and that includes you know foxes, skunks, bears, coyotes, um, possums, you know any of those um, animals that are just working the shoreline, again, looking for that easy meal, will not um, turn down a loon egg if they can get it. And crows and gulls and eagles will also take loon eggs. Eagles will also take loon chicks uh, if they can get them. And, um, and eagles have even been known to take out all loons on occasion. And so uh, back in the day, most of those reports were from the Midwest where their common loons are only about a half to two thirds the size of our big um, Northeastern loons here. But as eagle populations have increased far more rapidly in the state than loon populations, we're getting more and more reports of, uh, of eagles predating, you know, full-grown loons as, as well. So, and once hatched, these loon chicks aren't out of danger either um, because they're small and they're dark and they're too buoyant to dive away from approaching boats. And so these, these birds, when they're first born, are, are like little corks, you know, floating on the water. And so uh, often we don't, we simply don't see them or we expect that they'll be able to dive away as we boat up to them. And uh, collisions with power boats and jet skis are the number one human related cause of mortality of loon chicks in New Hampshire. And, you know, we don't actually have to, to impact them uh, to have an impact on them because too many boats too close to these loon families can impede the parental care and feeding of young. So I like to say that it is a full-time job for two adult loons to raise two chicks over the course of the summer. And we need to give them the space to be able to do that. The problem is that when these little chicks are hatched, they act as a magnet to people, right? So we all wanna get a little bit closer and share in that intimate moment of a loon family. The problem is at a certain point, as we approach these birds, they stop doing what they are, what they were doing, which is which, which is what they need to be doing, and why the reason why we wanted to observe them, um, and they begin to react to us instead. And so, uh, so they may be, you know, form a protective barrier around their loons. They may move away from us to try and put a little bit more distance, you know, um, between us and and them. And then, so you know, what do we do? Oh, well, we paddle a little bit harder to get back up into that family. And I've actually seen families of loons doing slow circuits around the lake being pursued by people in kayaks and, and canoes, right? As people are have like a little iPhone or, or, or our Samsung smartphone and try and get a beautiful wildlife photo of a loon. It always surprises me, right? Because if you're pursuing, if you're chasing a loon around, taking a picture, the picture that you're getting is the butt end of a loon. And that's not a great wildlife photo. I'm not sure why people insist on, on doing that. Um, but we really do have to give them the space to be able to do the stuff that they need to do. Every once in a while, we'll get somebody coming into the Loon Center and they'll say, oh, the loons, you know, were dancing for us. And I'm always surprised people don't recognize this is a sign of an animal in great distress. So this photographer, whoever it was, and I don't know who it was, was way too close to this loon. And these distraction displays um, which are meant to distract the, the, uh, uh, what the loon thinks of as a potential predator away from its nest or its mate or its chicks. Um, these are taking time and energy away from incubating those eggs or caring for those chicks from doing, then they need to be spending their energy in other ways than displaying for our benefit. The loons and other wildlife can become entangled in monofilament line that is tossed overboard or, or uh, simply discarded. 
and a loon trying to untangle that line. Because they have no opposable thumbs, the way they try, if they find themselves tangled up, the way they're going to try and untangle themselves is by working it out with their bill. And we actually can see loons that have had their bills entirely wired shut by this line. And if we can't get out there and catch that loon, it can actually die from a combination of starvation and exposure. So a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges facing these birds, none bigger than this one. Lead fishing tackle is a huge problem for our loons. And it seems like an odd thing. Why would a loon ingest lead tackle? And, and um, so there's, we know of at least three ways that, they, that this can happen. The first is that loons have no teeth. So they need to swallow their food whole, their fish that they catch whole. And then they follow that up by foraging along the lake bottom for little stones. And they swallow, the, they ingest those stones, they swallow them, and they hold those stones in the gizzard the muscular portion of their stomach, and they use those stones as surrogate teeth to grind up the fish that they have just eaten. And that's some uh, strategy that has served loons well for millions and millions of years until the last couple of hundred years when we've begun to uh, add things to their environment that are about the same size and shape as those little stones that uh, loons are looking for. And those are these lead split shot sinkers. And we used to think that that was the main way that a loon could, could catch, could get lead poisoning and then subsequently die of, of that lead poisoning. But we now think that there are two other methods that are actually more common. And so um, the, the a typical prey item for a loon is a small yellow perch, maybe six or you know four or six or eight inches um, long. But on occasion, loons can, can you know, pursue and capture and swallow larger fish. And when, when you're talking about a fish that's larger than an eight inch long yellow perch, you're beginning to get into a size of fish that could conceivably break an angler's line. And when that line gets broken, that fish is still gonna be trailing some length of that line and a hook and a, and, you know, and a sinker as well. And that fish is gonna be a little bit slower than the fish next to it. It's gonna be swimming a little bit erratically. And that's the fish a loon is gonna zero in on as an easy meal. And when that loon gets that fish, it also gets the hook and the line and the sinker that came with it. And then finally, if you're fishing, you're trying to catch a fish, but you can catch a loon instead because a loon's instinct is to strike at something if it flashes by it in the water. So the good news here um, is that if that ingested tackle is made of anything other than lead, and there's a huge number of things, right, that we can make tackle out of, and that includes steel, tungsten, bismuth, tin, iron, you know, stones, these new composite materials, rubber, any of those a loon can swallow and it will be just fine. But the smallest little split shot that you can imagine, if it's ingested by a loon, if it's made out of lead, will kill that bird within two to four weeks of ingesting it. So we're not asking people to stop fishing, uh, but we are um, asking them to clean out those old tackle boxes um, and get rid of that lead tackle. You can bring it to the Loon Center. You can go onto our, our uh, the loonsafe.org website that we have. A, we are working with New Hampshire Fishing Game and a whole bunch of retailers uh, throughout the state. We will actually pay people to bring in their tackle. We'll give them a ten dollar voucher that they can use to buy new non toxic Loon Safe um, tackle. And this is probably one of the most important things that you can do for a loon. So go and grab grandpa's dusty old tackle box out of the, the back corner of your garage and bring that to the loon center, bring it to a fishing game office, bring it to any of these retailers. And again, you can find them on loonsafe.org um, and trade that in for some new tackle. So back in 1975, people began to notice that loons were becoming less common on New Hampshire's lakes. The thinking was that if human activities had contributed to those declines, and it seemed likely that they had, then human activities, if they were coordinated and thoughtful, could reverse those declines. And that's the hope and the philosophy on which the Loon Preservation Committee was created. So our mission comes in three parts, to restore and maintain a healthy population of loons throughout the state, to monitor the health and productivity of loons as, as indicators of environmental quality, the health of our lakes and ponds, 
and to promote a greater understanding and a wider appreciation of not just loons, but also the larger natural world. The Loon Center here in Moultonboro is our headquarters and our visitor center, but LPC carries out programs of monitoring and research and management and education throughout the state. And we're helped in those efforts by close to a thousand volunteers throughout the state. Here are two of our newest volunteers. So it's a number of years ago now that these two girls set up a lakeside lemonade stand um, to help Loon Preservation Committee. And the thing that I love is that the same day that they came to empty their coffers uh, with their with their proceeds in, into LPC's um, accounts here, uh, they were joined by two other little girls who had independently come up with the exact same thing, an, a lemonade stand on another uh, lake in, in New Hampshire. So I, I'm always thinking this lemonade for loons thing is taking off and we're going to see how far we can go with that. And we also have a small but dedicated staff. And so each year we hire a number of seasonal field biologists. We send those out on our lakes to accomplish that monitoring and research and management and education. Um, this is actually our lineup for last summer for 2021. I need to update that uh, with, the, with the current uh, 2022 crew who just began a couple of days ago here at the Land Preservation Committee. So we don't pay these folks much, but we house them. So uh, this is uh, this was actual staff housing um, at the Loon Preservation Committee. My favorite comment on these cabins is that they're a little like Thoreau's cabin in the woods, but without all the bells and whistles that Thoreau had. And this year, and actually last year as well, we got a long awaited upgrade to those uh, facilities. So here are members of LPC's building committee uh, in front of our brand new Kitty and John Wilson Field Operations Center. Um, at the, at the, uh, the Loon Center campus. And so uh, we have housing for field biologists on the, up the top and we have uh, space underneath to do to service and store field equipment and boats and build rafts and, and uh, build signs and, and things uh, underneath. So this has been a huge addition to be able to support the always increasing work that we are doing in support of our loons in New Hampshire. Together, our members and our volunteers and our staff do several things. And the first thing that we do is we count loons um, because counting loons is our first indication of problems with our loon population. It's also the ultimate measure of our success in trying to keep these birds common. So LPC has been monitoring loons throughout the state since 1976. That monitoring actually uh, was responsible for adding loons to the threatened species list in 1978 as we are uh, able to document a continuing deep decline of these birds. Uh, happily, you know, we've more than tripled our population of since then. And over all these years of monitoring, we've actually created the longest running and most comprehensive database of loon populations and productivity that exists anywhere in the world right here in New Hampshire. And LPC every year, we monitor about 350 lakes throughout the state. Now, not all of those lakes have loons on them, but all of them have the potential to have loons. We hope that more of them will have loons in the future. And we deal with that large number of, um, of lakes by carving the state up into these different monitoring regions that you see. Uh, there are essentially five of them. And then we have three um, lakes on, on which we have one biologist dedicated to each lake. And that's Squam and Winnipesaukee and on Lake and Bagog, we actually work with a, a, a technician at Lake and Bagog National uh, wildlife Refuge to uh, keep track of, of those loons. This year, we've actually split our lakes region into a western and an eastern um, half as there, our populations happily continue to grow. Um, and what we're finding is that it's just too much at this point for one biologist to deal with. So it's one thing to say our loons are increasing or they're decreasing. We also wanna know what are the factors that are contributing to those changes? And so we do research of various kinds. And one of our research activities is to ban loons. And we ban loons because despite their popularity, there is an awful lot that we still don't know about these birds. So a question as simple as how long do loons live? I don't know, nobody knows. Um, we think you know, 20 to 30 years, um, maybe typical is our, is our best guess as to loons in the wild, but we've only been banding loons for about 30 years. Uh, now and, and so we really don't know um, how long these loons can can live. 
Um, and of course, the reason we ban loons is so we can uniquely identify those individuals and begin to follow them over their lifetime. Um, and so it's not only a question as simple as how long do loons live, but it's, a, it's, it's questions like, do loons mate for life? Do they come back to the same lake uh, year after year? What's the age of first reproduction over, uh, of a loon? What is, their life, what is their reproductive output over their lifetime? Where do our loons go in the wintertime? And what are the migratory pathways that they use to go back and forth? All of those questions, until very recently, were either unknown, uh, and even today, they're still based on pretty limited data. And, and so every loon that we uh, band gets a unique combination of bands. So there's only going to be one loon anywhere in, in uh, New Hampshire, anywhere in North America, for that matter, that has, say, a green dot over silver on the left leg and a, a white stripe over blue dot on the right leg. And once we see that bird again, um, we, can we can figure out exactly which bird that is and begin to get answers to all of these questions that we feel are pretty important to be able to, uh, to manage uh, these birds and, and understand their life history a little bit better. As long as we have a loon in the hand, we take a small sample of blood. Uh, we test that blood for lead, for mercury, for other contaminants, for stress indicating hormones, for blood parasites. Um, we can look at liver and, and kidney function in that blood. We can do genetics work on, on loon blood. So we can learn an awful lot about those birds and their general health just by taking that small sample of blood. We also clip a couple of feathers. We can test those feathers for mercury uh, and other contaminants. We've, um, uh, we can do genetics work on the feathers as well. We've even begun testing for cyanobacteria toxins in loon feathers. So and this chick is, is too small uh, to ban. So we're not gonna ban the spur. We're not gonna take any samples of blood or any feathers. But when we capture the adults, as you can see, we're doing this work at night. Um, so as we capture those adults, we also capture the chicks um, and we do that simply to hold those chicks for safekeeping. And so that when we release the, the, uh, the adults, um, we, can kill, we can keep the family together in the night. And of course, banding, it's exciting work, right? Accidents happen. We also work to rescue loons in trouble uh, when that can be done safely or at least relatively safely. So here is our uh, senior biologist, John Cooley, uh, pushing the canoe across very thin ice that had just set up, you know, the night before on Hatch Pond uh, and had left this loon stranded without the watery runway that it needed to be able to take off and, and leave for the ocean. And here's how that loon uh, repaid John, took a pretty good stab at him, as you can see those, those nice angry red marks above and, and below John's eye. Turns out this loon had a history because John had banded it the summer before and it had been so feisty as he brought it into the canoe to bend it, it almost tipped the canoe. Um, so it was, uh, it's an interesting uh, individual that John had there. And then the next summer after that, uh, a couple of uh, field biologists rescued a loon, an injured loon on Crystal Lake in Eaton. And turns out when we got that bird in the hand, if you look really closely, you can see that that bird is banded. Turns out this is the same loon that took a chunk out of John. And so with some of these birds, we begin to have quite a history um, with these animals. And the loons that are not so lucky, the ones that we can't, you know, uh, pick up and, and rescue uh, or, or, the, uh, or the ones that we find dead, um, these go to Dr. Mark Popris uh, at Tufts University. He's now retired, uh, but, but essentially we've been sending loons to Mark since the mid-1980s, uh, and Mark has been telling us what they died of. Turns out that is really an important thing to do, because if we can find out what's killing individual loons, we can begin to get a sense of what's affecting these birds on a population level. Um, and so even though Mark is retired, he continues to send great veterinary interns our way every summer. Um, he has trained LPC staff now as well as about how to do loon necropsies. Um, and he keeps his hand in, you know, doing necropsies as, as well. Uh, so he continues to be just an absolutely essential part of, of our work. We love Mark um, and we're very happy that we fell in with him because together we've been able to do a lot of good for loons. And as just one example of that, this is the work that first alerted us to the problem of lead sinkers and lead headed fishing jigs in our loons. 
We also collect unhatched loon eggs from failed nests. Um, and uh, we can test these eggs for contaminants. Uh, mercury, I've already talked about. Uh, in a, a little while, I'll talk about a wide suite of other contaminants that we're looking at now. We can look at embryo development. We can look at eggshell thickness. Um, and then we archive these egg contents and shells to establish baseline data uh, and also for future research, because there may be things that we don't even know today that we should be looking at. Um, but as we go into the future and begin to figure out that some new chemical contaminant is a problem for loons, we can then trace the, the establishment and the rise of that contaminant in these loon eggs as well. So, and then we also work to minimize human impacts on loons. And uh, we do several things to help our loons. One of the things that we do is we float rafts. And these rafts help loons that have been displaced from their traditional historical nesting sites because of shoreline development. They also help loons on lakes with changing water levels because they float. So they go up and down as water levels go up and down. Last year, we floated 104 of these uh, rafts and one out of every three chicks hatched in New Hampshire came from a raft floated by Loon Preservation Committee. This year, we have smashed that old record. We are floating uh, 130, give or take, uh, of these rafts on lakes throughout uh, New Hampshire um, with the hope that they'll be able to help these loons overcome some of the specific challenges that they're facing uh, in order to be able to nest successfully and, and raise their young. We also float signs around nesting loons. Um, last year, we protected 140 nesting pairs of loons with these signs. And uh, nesting pairs of loons protected by these measures hatched more than one out of every two chicks hatched in the state. So most of the signs that we float are kind of small and polite like this one, loon nesting sanctuary, please stay away. These are the ones we float on Winnipesaukee, a little bit larger, a little bit more direct, uh, but we do what we need to do to give these loons a little bit of space to be able to uh, hatch those eggs successfully. We also place educational signs at access points of lakes. And we do this because once a loon has been hit uh, by a boat or a jet ski or tangled up in monofilament line or swallowed a lead sinker or lead headed jig, there's often a lot, a lot that we can do to save that bird. And so with that in mind, we put a lot of our effort um, into talking to people about loons and their needs and trying to keep these things from happening in the first place. And it's really in those areas where we have been able to encourage a culture of respect and appreciation. Those are the places in New Hampshire that loons have thrived. We also give exhibits. We do educational presentations like this one. Um, in past years, we've given over 120 of these in-person um, presentations. COVID put a little bit of a kibosh on, on that. And so it's reduced uh, ever so slightly the number of in-person talks that we give. Uh, but as with all you know, other organizations, we've pivoted to do more Zoom um, organizations and more work with social media and, and things um, in order to get the word out. You know, um, And this here is a, a, a picture of uh, Tiffany and Dave Erler from the Squam Lakes Natural Science Center. Um, and we've actually partnered with Squam Lakes Natural Science Center for a number of years now um, to give loon cruises on Squam Lake. You know, the most important educational work we probably do is one on one, you know, interactions between our biologists as they're in the field doing that monitoring and management and research and the people that they encounter on their lakes. And the, one of the things that we don't want our field biologists to do is, you know, um, boat up to somebody on the water and start to wag a finger and tell them all the things that they are doing wrong with respect to loons. And so what we do is give them a packet, you know, of, of non lead um, fishing jigs or fishing sinkers. And now we have a gift, you know, and a way to approach somebody um, and, and engage them and hopefully turn them into advocates for loons um, on our lakes. We've also uh, worked to try and educate our legislature. That's been a harder job at times, but there have been some notable successes there as well. And in fact, New Hampshire became the first state in the nation to restrict the sale and use of some sizes of lead sinkers and lead-headed fishing jigs based on LPC's data. So, and we are very happy back in 2013 to have Governor Hassan here at the Loon Center to sign Senate Bill 89. And that, that bill essentially closed a loophole that existed in the law at that time that was allowing the continued use and sale of some of these larger 
um, lead-headed jigs that were that we knew were still um, an issue for our loons, still being swallowed, still causing loon deaths. And so as of June of 2016, when that law went into effect, um, we're pretty confident that we have a very protective standard in New Hampshire um, to protect them from both lead-headed sinkers and lead-headed jigs here in this state. And so all of this has barely scratched the surface of the work that the Loon Preservation Committee does. I really encourage folks to go uh, visit our website at loon.org. Um, so we have more, much more information there about the natural history of loons. We have um, uh, clips of the different calls made by loons along with an explanation of what those calls mean, what loons are saying to each other as, you, as we hear them calling to each other um, in the, uh, uh, through the night. Uh, right now, you, if you scroll down to the bottom of that top page, uh, you will see our live loon cam. So you can actually click on that and see uh, live footage of what we think will soon be a nesting pair of loons up on a, uh, one of LPC's uh, rafts on, a, on uh, one of our lakes in, in New Hampshire. So I encourage folks to go back there. Uh, we're always adding new information, not just about loons, but also about LPC's work in support of loons and some of the, um, some of the uh, results of that work as well. And so let's talk uh, about some of those results. And so the good news is that in 2021, we had more than four times the number of paired loons as we had when we began this work back in 1975. And so the number, that's that top red line that you see there. And paired adults is simply an adult that will pair up with another adult, will defend an area of lakes. So they get their own territory that they will defend from other loons. And they have at least the potential to breed and to contribute to that next um, generation of, of loons. Uh, so the black, you know, um, line nesting pairs were also up from the year before. Uh, chicks hatch and chicks surviving were down a little bit. And, and last year was a difficult year for our nesting loons. Um, but uh, overall, you know, the trends are still up. But at the same time as we say that, somewhere in between those two green lines at the top of that, lap, of that raft is where we think the actual carrying capacity of New Hampshire ought to be for loons. And as you can see, we're still far short of where we ought to be. And that space in between those green lines and the top of that red line, that's a lot of empty lakes. And we still think that there ought to be loons on those lakes and we're continuing to work to continue the recovery of this loon population so that those empty lakes can finally, once again, have loons on them. So on the face of it, you know, the, the, the trends look like they're going in a generally a positive direction and they are, but if we go a level deeper into that data, um, we get a little bit of a different picture. And so this graph is the, is chick surviving her territorial pair per year. So the red line on this graph represents 0.48 chick surviving per pair per year. And we know from research done by the Loon Preservation Committee and by other organizations that this is the number that we want to reach more often than not if we want to assure a stable population of loons in the state. And of course, we want to do more than just keep a stable population. We would like to continue to grow our population and continue to, to recover that population. So this is an important graph because the years where we've seen the strongest gains in our loon population is where we spent several consecutive years well above that line. So I refer folks to the early 2000s, right? From about you know 2000s to 2005, 2006, um, since then, as you can see, it's been harder to stay above that line. We didn't make it in 2021. Um, the good news is that in six of the past you know, 10 years, we have been at or above that line. But as we look at the, our increasing difficulty in staying above that line, the question that we have is as we continue to lose adult loons from lead, lead tackle or from monofilament or, or just from natural you know, causes, where are the chicks going to be coming from to, to replace those adult loons that we're losing? So when we looked at where the problem you know, seemed to be, what we found was that loons were continuing to come back from the ocean year after year. They were continuing to pair up. They were continuing to nest. Um, but the most variable of, those po of the parameters that we measure is nesting success. So it seemed like on some years, fewer of the eggs that our loons are laying are actually hatching. And so we began to ask ourselves, well, what are the factors that can uh, influence the hatching success, the nesting success of loons? And one of the problems are there are a lot of them, you know? And so loons 
are living in these complex natural systems and they're subject to these multiple co-occurring stressors. So this is actually a mathematical model that's based on more than 45 years at this point of loon data to try and elucidate some of those defining relationships or some of the things that are driving this population, some of the positive and the negative feedback loops and things. This is still a work in progress. It's already been useful, you know, to help us understand loons and understand where we could, could better put our limited resources into helping them. But, um, but as we're still working on this and, and figuring out these complex relationships, there's a really easy thing that we can do. And that is take these inviolable loon eggs from nests that we know have failed and open them up and see what's inside of them. And when we did that, we found some pretty disturbing things. So the red line on this graph is the level of each of these contaminants along the bottom of this graph that are known to affect the health or the reproductive success or the survival of other wildlife species. So we don't wanna be anywhere close to that red line for any of these um, contaminants. And as you can see, we are well above that red line for many of them. And so what I'm not gonna go through all of these, but a couple of them I think you know, are, are worth talking about a little bit. So PBDEs on the far left of that graph. Um, so PBDEs are flame retardants. And the great thing about PBDEs is they keep things from catch, catching fire easily. And so we use them everywhere. They're ubiquitous. And so, you know, the, the office chair that I'm sitting at has PBDEs in it. The carpet, you know, in your home has PBDEs in it. Your couch has PBDEs. Your television, your laptop, your, your stereo loaded with PBDEs. Your kids' pajamas have PBDEs in them. And if you read on the, the packaging that comes with those pajamas, it will often say after 10 washes, these pajamas are no longer flame proof or flame retardant. And the reason for that is that PBDEs tend not to bind chemically to the substrate on which they're applied. So where do they go then when they're in the wash, you know, down the drain and from there into our lakes and ponds and from there into the wildlife of, of our lakes and ponds. And they begin to move up the food chain biomagnifying as they go until they can get to some very high concentrations in um, wildlife and people who eat the fish in our lakes. So PFAS is another, you know, PFAS is in all the news. It's one of the components of PFAS, which we're finding in our well water and things. We're also finding them in our loon eggs and at concentrations that are close to three times the levels which are known to affect, again, the health or the survival or the reproductive success of other wildlife species. Um, and then, you know, PCBs, our old friends, PCBs. So we stopped making these in the 1970s, but they are still being found in many of our loon eggs at levels three times the levels that are known to cause harm to other wildlife. And that's because taken together, the things at least on the left-hand side of this graph are, are known as, you know, the forever chemicals or, or POPs, persistent organic pollutants. Persistent because once they're in our environment, they tend to stay in our environment and there's no easy way to get rid of them. So there's a real um, caution here in our effects on some of our, in our environment and some of our wildlife as well. Uh, we've also placed temperature data loggers now in our loon nests. And so that we're, what we're trying to do here is investigate the effects of temperatures and temperature extremes on our loons because loons are northern birds. And here in New Hampshire, we are close to the southern edge of the breeding range of, of the common loon in North America. So as our um, temperatures continue to warm, as we're subject to more uh, heat waves and things, that is not gonna spell anything good for our loon. So back in 2014, we put up the first of our loon webcams. Um, and uh, and we, we put this up primarily, I guess, as a research tool because we wanted to be, begin to figure out what were the things that were causing loon nest failures. But as long as we were gathering this data and it was a good research tool, we thought, why not throw this on the web so that we can share it with the public and maybe they might be interested in seeing some live footage of a nesting pair of loons. And of course, they were. So our webcams have been um, hugely popular. It's turned out to be a great research tool but also a great outreach tool and a great public education tool as, as well. And as impressive as all that stuff was, we didn't think that, and this is a picture from that first webcam in 2014, where we, uh, the, uh, 
uh, it's high def these days and it's a much better picture. I encourage you to check it out at moon.org. Um, but um, we, you know, as we were thinking about all the good things that could come out of, of this uh, effort, we didn't think though that it would actually save a nesting a loon and, and a, a loon nest. Uh, but that's exactly what happened because one night on a Friday evening, we had a post on our Facebook page from somebody in Missouri of all places that said, hey, that loon I think has is tangled up and want to film in fishing line. Of course, that's a potentially lethal issue for our loon. So the very next morning, as the sun came up, we were on the webcam. Sure enough, you know, that loon was tangled up in monofilament line. Within an hour, we had sent a, a crew of biologists off there, capture that loon off the nest, remove that monofilament, returned it to the nest, and two days later, it had a chick. So that was kind of a, uh, a, nice, uh, a nice benefit of having our webcam up there as well. So we talked a lot about um, reproductive success and success in, in preserving our loon population depends on two things, right? One is increasing breeding success, but the other is decreasing avoidable adult mortality of loons. And here is where lead is king. And so over the years, we found even still over 40% of the adult loons collected on our lakes um, have, have, a, have been dead or dying because they have ingested lead fishing tackle. So this is just an indication of what a severe problem uh, this is. And I will entreat everyone once again to, to go through those dusty old tackle boxes and take that lead out of those tackle boxes and bring it to us. We will take it uh, from you um, and eventually you will be saving loons because if that tackle gets used, some of it is gonna end up in one or more loons and it will kill them. So then we had you know, something new happen. In the winter of 2020, 2007, we found 22 loons stranded up on the ice on Lake Winnipesaukee. So this is one of the lucky five that were found alive and they got a quick trip to the ocean and, and were released on, on the Atlantic. And, but another 17, you know, had already perished by the time that we were even aware that this problem was, was happening. I'm gonna apologize, it was kind of a gruesome slide um, coming up here, but this is our senior biologist, John Cooley, taking some measurements on some of these um, deceased loons uh, before we sent them to Mark Pokras so that Mark could help us uncover the mystery of why we, why these birds perished on Winnipesaukee. And what Mark found was that three of these birds had swallowed lead fishing sinkers or, or lead header jigs, and they were going to die anyway. There was nothing we could have done to save them. But the other 14 of them that had perished were all healthy, except that they were molting their flight feathers. Uh, as you can see from this loon, there's a picture of a loon on the, on the Atlantic here in the wintertime. You can see the ragged trailing edge of that wing. So this loon is dropping those big flight feathers. Um, and loons will do this only once in the, in the year, and they'll do it on the winter when they should be on the ocean because they, at that point, they, they shouldn't need to fly anywhere. The problem was that in the winter of 2007, we had record warm temperatures and Winnipesaukee had not frozen over. So these loons, um, as they were migrating through or, or just as they were making their rounds in, on, on uh, lakes here in New Hampshire, um, when he was open, and the fishing was good, the weather was warm, they decided that they were gonna stay for a while. And when the cold snap finally did happen in early February and the ice closed in on them, it caught them right in the middle of that wing feather molt and they were unable to leave. And here's another uh, interesting photo. So this is a microscope slide showing an avian malaria parasite taken from a dead loon from Lake Mbagog. Uh, a number of summers ago. So here is avian malaria, um, certainly if not a tropical disease, it's certainly a warm weather disease that killed a loon in New Hampshire and not a loon right on the border with Massachusetts. This was Lake and Bagog is north of the notches. And so this is an area of the state that we uh, were thinking and hoping would be a refuge, at least for a time from the effects of a warming climate that does things like increase the ranges of pathogens, you know, for, for loons and introduces um, pathogens that loons have never had to deal with that they are now having to deal with. And so as a result of these things, winter strandings on, on Winnipesaukee and, and pathogens, you know, expanding their range due to warming temperatures, um, we have now added climate change to that pretty long list of stressors facing loons here in New Hampshire. 
But on the other hand, there are positive things happening for our loons as well. And that includes the research being done by Loon Preservation Committee and other great organizations, uh, all the management that, that uh, we are doing to help these birds, um, a number of wonderful organizations working to, to conserve shoreline habitat for loons and other wildlife species at, in New Hampshire and the education uh, that we're doing here as well as including educating our decision makers in, in the legislature. So of course the question is, will our efforts be enough? Will all of this work that we're doing uh, be enough to help loons overcome some of the challenges that they are facing and help them persist in our environment here in New Hampshire? And to answer that question, we took everything that we've been able to learn about loons, the life history aspects, the challenges facing loons at present and the challenges we expect them to face in the future and our ability to help the loons to, to overcome those challenges, to mitigate those challenges. And we ended up forecasting the future of our loons. And when we did that, we found that the future of loons in New Hampshire is not assured, but neither is it a lost cause. And so as with so many things, what New Hampshire looks like 50 or 100 years from now in terms of our loon population is going to depend on how much we care about these birds. So hopefully at this point, you might be asking how you can help. And the good news is there are ways. So if you'll recall, I talked about tracking 350 lakes throughout the state. Um, you know, with 10 or 11 field biologists every every season. And so that is a lot of lakes for every one of those field biologists. And so we really rely on the help of our volunteers. And we do need volunteers to get involved in the work that we're doing. There are several different ways to do that. One easy, one really easy way is that every year on the third Saturday of July from 8 to 9 a.m., so one hour period every year, we try and get as many people as we can out on our New Hampshire lakes counting loons. Um, and this helps, you know, this helps us in many different ways. It can, it can help, you know, to establish loons on the nest or even chicks that have hatched or that one of our field biologists haven't gotten around to um, yet. It can help us if we have two lakes and we're not sure if there's one pair of loons sharing two lakes, it sometimes happens. It can help us figure out, you know, some of those mysteries of, of things as, as well. And the wonderful thing about this loon census is that at the same time as we're doing this in New Hampshire, people in Maine and Vermont, and even in Massachusetts are doing it at the same time. So we're getting a regional snapshot in time of our loon population. But we can, you can also watch loons over the course of the season. And so the first time you see loons um, on your lake, back on your lakes in the spring, we would love to know about that. We would love to hear from you. The first time you see a pair of loons, the first time you see loons on the nest, Certainly the first time you see chicks and, and, and how many of those chicks survive until later in the summer. Um, we would love to be able to hear from you uh, on all of those things. You can educate lake users. You can become an advocate for loons on your lakes. Uh, and you can even, if you are so inclined and so inspired, become a member of a loon preservation committee. And I would refer people back to our website again at loon.org. Uh, we would love to have you as a member. And in fact, right now we are in our member a day in May challenge um and uh and what we're trying to do is get at least one new member every day in in may um so i encourage folks to uh to sign up and help support the good work that we are trying to do for these birds and so you know there's still much work to be done and lpc's work goes far beyond loons and it goes far beyond new hampshire loons are a sentinel of environmental quality they're an indicator of the health of, of our lakes and ponds or aquatic ecosystems they're scientifically important and they have this wide public appeal. And that's the reason why loons have become the focal point for so many of these environmental issues. And that means that if we can save loons, then we can save a lot of other species that depend on the same quiet places and, and you know, clean water. Uh, and I like to think that at the same time as we have been working to uh, encourage our loon population and, and recover that population, We've also been working to encourage an environmental ethic. And ultimately, that's going to help not only loons, but other wildlife and even the people and the economy of New Hampshire. Because after all, that's a large part of the reason why many of us want to live and, and visit here. And so, you know, I hope that the end result of all of our efforts is going to be a bright future for loons in New Hampshire. And I prefer to think of this as a sunrise photo. 
And so that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I hope that people have questions and I would love to answer um, questions that people have. Nora, is this the point where I hand it back off to you? Yes, um, or <clears throat> yes, that it will get a little bit more, um, more interactive. So Harry, but thank you so much, um, so much for that. Um, in terms You're very welcome, Nora. Thank you. I was thrilled to get the invitation, as I said. <laughs> um, so in terms of questions that, that have come in, you touched on it briefly, but I know that several, because I heard about it from, um, from several individuals that, um, that Northern Woodlands Magazine ran an article in recent months on um, the avian malaria at um, up at Umbagog. Um, so can you talk a little bit, uh, just yes. does that continue to be um, an issue up there? And, uh, yeah. and is it not, I mean, is it not being seen on Winnipesaukee or Squam? Yeah, no, you know, boy, Nora, I wish that I could say that, but after that first um, loon, this is probably, this might, uh, five, six years ago, something along those lines, that we had our first um, indications, you know, that that uh, avian malaria was impacting our, our loon population. Um, and since then, sadly, there have been a, a number, of, you know, of, of others. I think our worst year might have been four or five loons, you know, that were that were hit by avian malaria. Um, and these things, they, they tend to um, occur, you know, later in, in um, Later in June and, and into July is when we seem to see the peak of our of our cases. And the, the, the tragic part of that is that we've had loons that were in the process of incubating nests, you know, or, or caring for chicks. Um, and, and they've been killed by avian malaria, which then inevitably means that you lose the nest, you know, or you lose the chicks as well. Because as I said, it's a full-time job. You know, we, you really do need both of, uh, both, both parents um, active to, to be able to, to bring up chicks here and there. Um, in New Hampshire. And so um, it's it's an issue. And even though the numbers seem small, you know, to people, the life history characteristics of, of loons are such that even a small number of deaths of adult loons can have a really outsized impact on the population. And so, you know, for instance, you know, so loons are a long lived bird. We don't know how long, but indications are, you know, they can be 30 years or, or even longer. They have a delayed age at reproduction because as we've begun to ban loons, what we have found is that the average age of breeding of a, of, a, of a loon is five or six years old. And we followed some loons that are 10 or 11 years old before they first bred successfully. And then they have a limited ability to reproduce in any year. And so um, they, they lay a maximum of two eggs. And, and a good year in New Hampshire is when we have a half the surviving chick per pair per year. So one, one chick every second year. And any animal with those life history characteristics, the key to maintaining a viable population is to keep adult loons alive so that they have many years and many opportunities over their lifetime to, to replace themselves and, and reproduce. And that's why things like avian malaria and things with like um, lead sinkers and lead-headed jigs that affect primarily the adult you know, population are so very damaging to our loon population. Yeah. Um, and, and have cases bit of avian malaria, have they been seen on the southern lakes in New Hampshire as well? Yes, they have. Yeah, I know certainly one, uh, one happened on Squam. Uh, one, I believe, was on Winnipesaukee and, and others were on other, you know, lakes here as, as well. So, you know, mm -hmm. our fingers are crossed because now not only, you know, do we have avian malaria, but we have the avian flu, right? That's that's coming in. I just did. I think we have, we have our first documented case of a loon um, dying from avian influenza, and that was out in the in the Midwest somewhere. So we've not yet documented it here in, in New Hampshire, uh, but we suspect that it's coming and it's going to be one more thing, you know, facing these birds. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that that was, yeah. Uh, it, it's a tough life out there for a loon. It's not all just um, lolling about in the, in the sun and, and, you know, catching a fish once in a while. They have, they have some, uh, they have some good challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so I know you spoke a lot about, um, 
you know, sort of the human wildlife interaction and the, um, you know, the stress that humans either intentional trying to get that perfect photo or unintentionally, um, you know, getting too close, um, yeah. to the birds, you know, is, is adding stress. Do you, I, I know with, with numerous species, we find this habituation to humans. Do you find on any of the lakes subsets of the population that, um, you know, sort of become not immune to humans, but that they're, they're much, you, you know, more used to their presence? Yeah. Um, boy, Nora, that, that's a great question. Yes. And we do find that. So loons can become um, habituated within some limits, you know, to human activities. And so, for instance, our, our loons up in the North Country tend to be very skittish. And I hear, uh, you know, reports of uh, on a fairly large lake, you know, our biologists will put their kayak in and the loons are already tremoloing, you know, giving alarm calls and, and things of, of that nature. So we have to be really cautious on those lakes about not disturbing the animals that we're here to protect, you know, and, and encourage. Um, on the other hand, on Winnipesaukee, you, you know, you can, sometimes you can come fairly close, you know, to these birds without them seeming to have, you know, to show much of a, um, uh, of, of a, of a disturbance, you know, to our presence. However, um, you know, sometimes these things can be really subtle, you know, and so we, we may not even be aware that we're causing um, these loons harm or that we're having an impact. And um, I remember talking with Judy Silverberg at New Hampshire Fishing Game. She's retired now, but uh, mm -hmm. I always remember something that she'd said. And she said, any time that you've caused a wild animal to change its behavior, you've had an impact on that animal. Um, and so how that can play out with loons you know, so for one of the, one of the aspects of loon biology is that there's about a 24-hour gap between the first chick and the second chick hatching, and so it so what that causes is that there's an imbalance between those chicks. So there's a there's a dominance hierarchy, right? So the first chick is going to be a dominant chick, and that second chick is going to be submissive, and the parents do, really don't play favorites with loon chicks. They will just you know feed the first chick that comes to them, you know. But the dominant chick makes sure it's the first one that gets there. And once that dominant chick has had its fill, then the second chick gets fed. And what can happen is if there are too many people getting too close to these loons and those parents are spending a little bit too much time watching us, keeping an eye on us, instead of diving for fish for both of those chicks, that second chick is not getting fed and it's going to starve. And we may not even be able to, you know, people wouldn't think like, you know, by coming in, by being even, um, even subtly, you know, interacting with these birds and just not giving them the space, they, they may not think that it's very harmful, but you get enough people, you know, doing that if for enough times and you've, and you've just lost a chick, you know, you've just had the reproductive success of that, of that um, pair of loons for that year. Um, and over time, that can make itself felt at a population level. So, you know, we really do. I mean, if there's only two, two messages that I hope people will come away from this talk is one, and you've heard me say this already a number of times, bring us your lead tackle, you know, turn that lead tackle in. But the other is give these birds some space. Right. And so I often say, if you want to get close to a loon on the water, there's only one way to do that. And that's with a good pair of binoculars. You know, if you want to take a picture of a, you know, a beautiful wildlife photo of a loon, there is only one way to do that. And that's with a long telephoto lens. You know, you need to give these birds some space so that they can do the things that they need to do to bring those two chicks up over the course of the season. Okay. Um, and I, it's funny, Tom sent this question in and I had been thinking the same thing because I know this question comes up every year. And, and that is how many acres does a lake need to be um, to host a mated pair? Sure, yeah. So we have uh, some lakes that are less than 50 acres, you know, pretty, pretty really, you know, small lakes that can actually have a pair of loons on them and they can be successful. Um, lakes that are up to about 300, from between 100 and 300 acres is probably the, just the best case scenario for loons. And that's a lake at which one loon pair will defend that entire lake. So that's their, the entire lake is their territory. Um, 
And those loons tend to be very, very successful. When you get to, to, and these are all rules of thumb, right? But when you get to lakes that are about 300 acres or more, you will often get another pair of loons setting up, you know, and one can be on the north end of the lake, one can be the south end of the lake. And there'll be a little bit of, you know, interacting between those two loons, but they'll work at the boundary and they'll be able to coexist, you know, on that lake pretty well. And they, both of those pairs can be successful. When you get up to lakes the size of Squam or Winnipesaukee, the rights of Squam, 7,000 acres, we typically have 13, 14, sometimes even 15 pairs on there. Winnipesaukee, 44,000 acres, you know, of, of water. Um, historically, we think probably 50 pairs or more on Winnipesaukee. These days, we usually have 28 to 30, you know, pairs on that. So it's a lot better than it was, but we still have a long way to go um, before we get back to those historical um, levels of, again. And then the flip side, and this is an interesting thing that we learned a little bit more recently. We've, learned, we've known about it for some time now that loons can actually knit together a number of smaller lakes, you know, even smaller than, smaller than 100 acres, smaller than 50 acres, and they will piece together a territory by several smaller lakes, you know, and in those cases, what they will often do is nest on one lake and they will feed the chicks entirely from the resources of that lake. But when it, but they will fly off to one of the other lakes and feed themselves, you know, to kind of shepherd the, the resources of that lake. And that's a harder prospect for loons because it's more difficult to, um, those territories tend to be not quite as good quality and loons nesting on them tend to be not as successful you know, as the, as the prime habitat, 100 to 300 acres, but some of them can make it work, you know, year after year and, and, and bring a chip or two off on those lakes as well. All right. Um, well, that, um, well, Harry, thank you so much. That brings us to the, um, the end of the questions that have come in, um, unless anyone else has, um, has a question for Harry, um, at which, you know, at this, Time, you are welcome to to unmute yourself and ask it um, directly. Great. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for um, for this presentation, um, for sharing this information, and for all of the all of the great work that that LPC is doing. Oh, uh, th thank you, Nora. And as I said, it's really my pleasure. Um, a Tin Mountain is such a great organization. And the, the work that the Loon Surveys are, are, are doing to help, it, what a great collaboration between LPC and, and Tin Mountain. So I love your organization, I love your center, and, and uh, I was, I'm thrilled to be able to, uh, uh, to contribute and, and be part of your series here.